What is up guys and welcome back. Today we are taking a break from our regularly scheduled Global War 1936 content to talk about another game that I really like and that I wanted to do a review on called Undaunted Normandy. This game uh, follows a similar theme to Global War 1936. You know, given my normal posts on YouTube, I do have a specific audience that I cater to. So today is no different. We're going to be talking about the Second World War and a game about the Second World War. But this game is a little bit more simple than Global War 1936, which, to be honest, isn't hard to do. In this game, you're, you go through certain scenarios in a scenario book, and each scenario takes about... 45 minutes to an hour could be shorter could be longer depending on how you guys do and the reason that I love this game so much is that it Combines my two favorite types of board games in the world Which the first obviously being wargaming and the second being uh, deck building games I am a huge fan of deck building games because they uh, give you a lot of replayability and a lot of really fun strategy So this game is a great combo of deck building and wargaming and without further ado, let's get into the review. Okay, so in this mild size box, we've got a Target brand cocktail glass here for scale. Not a very big box, but you get a ton of stuff in here. All of the game components are very simple, just these easy, uh, durable cardboard counters that you don't have to worry about breaking or anything. Two decks of cards, 17 square panels to make the maps some victory point markers, four D10, which is a weird shape. D10 honestly aren't my favorite in the world, but they do their job and they work okay. And then of course we've got a rule book and a scenario book, which is what you're gonna use most of the time. All right, so some basic backstory on this game. You and one other person, it's a two player game, are assuming the positions of a platoon commander just after D-Day when the United States forces have landed in France. And you're going to play through a series of scenarios of historical battles of the U.S. versus German forces. Usually that entail one side capturing some victory points denoted by these yellow markers while the other side is just trying to pin the his opponent, which means eliminate all of the rifleman squads. So throughout the course of the campaign, during each of the scenarios, your forces will be arrayed in the basic structure of a platoon in World War II. You'll have three squads of riflemen, A, B, and C, as well as three scouts to go along with your riflemen and clear the way for them, as well as gunners for each of your squads a b and c to provide covering fire pin your opponents and do some damage as well and along with each of your three squads in your platoon you'll have a detachment of snipers as well as a detachment of mortars that you can deploy as you see fit the American forces are, are arrayed in the exact same way. Three squads of scouts, rifles, and gunners, as well as a detachment of mortars and snipers. Throughout the game, you'll be tasked with controlling certain victory points labeled by these yellow flag-shaped markers. The only way that you can control these victory points is by moving your riflemen into the square that they are located and using a control action. But to do that, you have to have the square scouted. Your riflemen can only move into squares which have been scouted, indicated by these uh, binoculars. So you'll have to move your scout in, which will scout this area, and then you can move your riflemen in behind him and control the area, which means you have earned this victory point. Until such a time that the enemy knocks you off this square, moves in, and controls it at which point you lose control of that victory point and the other team will then control it. So that's the basic structure of the game. You just wanna control your victory points, which is pretty simple in and of itself. And the reason that this game is so replayable and fun is that the way that you carry out each of these actions is through deck building. Each squad will have an array of cards that represents his platoon 
It's a pretty thick deck. You've got a lot of guys in there. And in this deck, you've got your platoon sergeant, which is your second in command, a platoon guide that you can purchase. You've got squad leaders for A, B, and your C squads. You've got your riflemen, A, B, and C. You've got your scouts, A, B, and C. You've got your machine gunners, of course, A, B, and C. And then you've got your mortars and your snipers. Now there are also a bunch of these fog of war cards, which will be added to your deck through certain game effects or by your opponent. And these just muddy up your hand and take up room and basically make your deck worse, which is a fun little mechanic. So let's set up a sample scenario here and we'll show you how this thing works and why it's so fun. And here we have the starting setup of the first scenario from the German perspective. You can see we have our forces arrayed here. This scenario only handles your A squad scouts and rifles as well as your B squad scouts and rifles. C squad does not make an appearance. No machine gunners, no mortars, no snipers. They ramp you up throughout the scenarios adding one or two new mechanics to make the learning process as easy as possible. So this is the first scenario, very basic. And the way we've got our forces set up here, we've got some victory points mostly on the left side, though the Germans do start out with three victory points already under control. The objective of this scenario is the first side to capture five victory points wins the scenario. So the Germans already have a three to zero head start but they have to cross this open field. And the way this game is going to function is you will start with a set deck of cards, which will be your starting units for the game. Usually it's one of each type of chip that starts on the game, as well as your platoon sergeant and the squad leaders of whatever squads you have out here. So we've got A and B squads so we've got the a and b squad leader as well as one rifleman from each squad one scout from each squad and our platoon sergeant here in the starting deck we've also got a couple fogs of war starting in our hand here just as some deck filler to make your life a little bit harder you also have the leftover cards in a public pool that you can draw from during the game you'll be able to add these cards into your deck to make it much better. So you have three total scout cards, as well as five total rifleman cards from each squad. So we've already got one B squad scout and one B squad rifle in this deck here. We will be able to draw up to four more rifles and up to two more scouts to add to our play deck during this scenario as well as we'll be adding some more Fogs of Wars from various activities like reconning new squares gives you a Fog of War, and your enemy can take an action to make you draw a Fog of War and put it into your discard pile. The way these turns work is we are going to draw the top four cards from our draw deck, and then we're gonna look at our hand here, and the very first action you take is notice this chip it has the U.S. side up. So this scenario starts with the U.S. having the initiative. That means they get to go first and make their moves. So each player is going to play a card face down, hidden from the other. So let's just take a card and place it face down over here. Now each card, each player will flip their card. And whoever has the higher number up here will gain the initiative for that turn. So just like that, we've played one card of our, out of our hand, we're down to three. Now the player who wins the initiative, in this case the Germans, will get to play their three cards in any order they want, take three actions, and then the US player will go. So this adds a little extra wrinkle to every turn to see who gets to go first. And if we happen to tie on this draw, then the initiative would have stayed with the person who already had it. Now going into our normal turn, we can play these cards in any order we want. Starting here with your platoon sergeant, you can take either of these two actions down here. 
So for example, this bolster action with the three next to it means that we can select any three cards from our available pool here and add them to our discard pile to be incorporated into our deck. So let's just grab two rifles and a scout and that will be our bolster three action. And once we've played this card, it will go into our discard pile with those cards that we just added. And then you will complete your turn. Your squad leader can do the same thing as the platoon sergeant, except he can only draw two cards that are members of the A squad. The riflemen are gonna be the bread and butter of your squad, so they can move, attack, and control, which if you'll recall, allows you to claim the victory points in a given square. Then once you've played the final card of your turn, they will all go into your discard. So after both people go, you will draw four more cards. If you have drawn the last card from your draw pile, you simply reshuffle your discard pile, thereby adding any cards that you've added from your available pool into your draw deck, and they are good to go. And you start again with the play loop, continuing on until somebody has achieved their objective. And while this play loop by itself is excellent and very, very fun, this game really shines in the strategy involved with the permanent death of your cards. So one of the riflemen's abilities is to attack. Obviously that means they're gonna fire at your units. If they score a hit, you have to lose a card associated with the tile that, that was hit. So if our A scouts here were targeted by an attack from the Germans and we are hit, we lose one of our cards for the rest of the scenario. Meaning that we now for the rest of this scenario only have two a scout cards available to us. So the more damage that your units take, the less often you're gonna be able to use them. The difference between five A rifles in this deck versus two A rifles in this deck is pretty significant in the frequency that you're gonna be able to draw. So the more damage that your units take, the less effective they are, the less combat effectiveness they have, you could say. If, for example, say these German A scouts get hit by an American attack, if we have no A scouts left in our draw pile or our discard, then this token is taken off the board and can no longer be targeted by attacks. Even though we may still have two A scouts in our available pool here, the, this token must come off the board and cannot be placed back on the board until we have an A scout that we draw into our hand and play, at which point, this token will, will come back onto the board and will once again be subject to enemy fire. This idea is important because if at any point during the game you have no rifleman tokens on the board, this means that you have been pinned and you will automatically lose the scenario. So even if we still have some, some rifles in our available pool here that we could add to our deck, if we have no rifle tokens on the board, we are pinned and we lose. So it's important to keep those numbers up in your squads and keep these tokens on the game map in the fight. Now that we've talked about the basic gameplay loop and how the game functions, let's talk about some of the things that I like about this game. For one, it's a lot shorter than, for example, Global War 1936. So just on those days where you maybe don't have 19 hours to drop on a board game, this is a good way to get two or three or four hours of gaming in and it stays interesting and fun that whole time because you've got plenty of different scenarios to play and you've got two different sides to play each of the scenarios as. So there's quite a bit of stuff to do in this small box and quite a bit of strategies in different, the different setups with the different units and the different defense values of each of the hexes. And there are even some hills that are introduced later on uh, that change your defense value based on where you're at on the map. Uh, so there's a lot of little mechanics in, the, in here, but they're all simple, and they introduce them to you one at a time, so it's never too overwhelming. It's easy to teach new players. One downfall to the game is that a lot of the scenarios hinge on very low probability dice rolls. For example, the way that the combat works in this game, we've got this rifleman card here. It says attack one. This one indicates the number of d10s that you roll for this attack. Your combat value is calculated based on distance, the defense value of the hex, and the defense value of the unit that you're targeting. 
So say we wanted our German A rifleman to attack somebody in this hex. Say these B rifles right here for the Americans. We'd add the distance, one, two, to the defense value of the hex, in this case, three, plus the defense value listed on this token, which is four. So that brings us to a total value of nine. So that means that we have to roll a nine or higher on this D10, which obviously is not a very good uh, probability for that roll, only 20%. And I didn't plan that, but hey, look at that, we got a hit. So now the B rifles would have to lose a card and their combat efficiency has significantly lowered. But I digress, the point is that combat is often rolled at very low values with very few dice. Scenarios can be dramatically altered by one player hitting a couple of low probability dice in a row. So that can certainly be frustrating sometimes, but the effect that that has on the game is very low because the scenarios are often pretty quick hitting, 45 minutes to an hour. So if you do happen to get diced, then you just finish the scenario, take your loss, and move on to the next one. And then you, maybe you'll get some good rolls next time. So I don't believe it's a huge issue, but it is something that has stuck out to me while playing the game. And while the, the low probability die are frustrating, it does make a little bit of a historical sense when you got a squad of five dudes running around with car 98Ks. You probably aren't gonna get that many hits with these guys. So while the combat and effectiveness of your riflemen can be frustrating at times, there are solutions in the game. As you progress through your scenarios, you will unlock more cards that can do very, very cool and unique things. The first being here, we have our typical machine gunners who attack with two dice, but they also have this unique suppress ability, which is similar to an attack, but you get four dice. And if you score a hit, you simply flip over the chip of the target, and you can see they have these blue lines here. That means that they are suppressed, and to get out of this state, they have to use a full action of playing this a scouts card to flip them back into their ready state. So this suppression ability on your machine gunners is very effective and does a little bit to get around those poor dice rolls that you're gonna have. We've also got mortar teams who ignore the distance modifier to your attack values. And finally, we've got these snipers who are awesome. They attack with three dice, which is very, very powerful. So there's going to be a lot of shooting and missing in this game, but that's part of it, and it's honestly a great part of it. I think it enhances the game, because uh, when you finally get that hit with your rifleman at a 9, then things start to look up for your scenario, and you think, hey, maybe I've got a shot to win this thing. So that's a bit how the combat works, and there is so much more that I haven't talked about that's hidden within the confines of this rulebook. And as you're going through these scenarios, they are not all created equal. Some will favor the Germans, some will favor the US. That's just part of the realism of these campaigns. I remember this one in particular, the river crossing. Very, very difficult for the Americans, but it swings back around, some will favor them. But at the end of the day, there is this section on the back here that lets you list all of your scenarios that you've played, your player, who they played as, how many casualties, you may have noticed throughout the course of this video that every single card in the game has a unique name. Right here we have George Schmidt, the sniper. So if George Schmidt were to hit four or five guys during a scenario, you could give him the Heroic Contribution Medal, which is just a fun little thing that helps you remember the uniqueness of each scenario that you play with your friends. Now the idea of this game is that you play through the entire campaign with one of your players as the US and the other as the Germans. And then at the end of the game, you count up how many scenarios each player won and lose some points based on how many casualties you've taken throughout the campaign. And then you can decide your winner. And we've got a couple different levels of victory here. So if it's a German domination, you get this full stop victory because the Germans were on defense or a stunning breakthrough if you're playing as the allies. So a couple different things that can happen depending on how your campaign goes. And it's really fun because as you're playing through each scenario, even if things go poorly and you know you're gonna lose it, maybe you wanna 
concede defeat, pull back, and limit those casualties because it will hurt you at the end of the day if you take a ton of casualties and lose the scenario. But guys, I can't say it enough. This game is awesome. I have a lot of fun doing it. It's simple, it's easy to teach, but it has a lot of really cool and unique mechanics. You've got a full platoon of men at your disposal for some small scale World War II combat, which is a nice change of pace from the more broad generic terms used in Global War 1936, where you've got full scale armies running at each other with some dice. So guys, that is the gist of Undaunted Normandy. It's a pretty quick hitting game for two people. I really, really enjoy it. I've had a lot of fun playing it. And if you can't get enough after playing through this campaign, there is an Undaunted North Africa campaign, which pits the Italians versus the British in North Africa with the addition of some new mechanics. There are scenario expansions for both Normandy and North Africa, as well as in November of 2022, they are releasing Undaunted Stalingrad. So guys, if you're looking for new games, I highly, highly recommend this one. It receives the official Board Gaming Bro stamp of approval. And until next time, guys, I will see you later.